Hello, everybody. I am James Intracasso, your host for Tabletop Voices. I go by he, him. Welcome. Today, we have an amazing guest who I cannot wait to share with you. So, Anna, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Let the people out there know who you are and what you've done in the world of tabletop role-playing games. Oh, hi. I'm I'm Anna Meyer, and I'm a cartographer. I do large world maps. for, for I've done it for Cobalt Press. I've done it my Greyhawk maps kind of the project that I started with, but now it's been for a bunch of different authors and, and game stuff. But I guess Greyhawk and Midgard has been what I've been mostly renowned for, so to speak, my biggest projects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you are an incredible uh, cartographer. I really Thank love you. your work. Very excited to have you on the show today. Um, before we jump into how you got doing this professionally and how you do it now, all day, every day, full time, uh, probably more <laughs> full time, like most oh, of yeah. us. Time wise, yes. Time wise, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely, right? Absolutely. So, what did you, uh, I'm sorry, take me all the way back. Like, when did you first play hands on a tabletop role playing game? What were oh, you that, playing? How did it go down? Uh, yeah. That was back in Sweden in like early, like 79, 80 or something like that. When a friend of mine had a friend or a friend of a friend or someone had been in America and picked up the original D and D box. If it was the brown box or the white box or something, I'm not really sure, but it was someone back in the day who got uh, brought it back to Sweden where I lived back then i moved to california almost eight years ago and then we we started playing and and i fell in love with it and i kept doing it ever since and and then i was part owner of a game store for like a decade and 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 i was part of organizing conventions and stuff like that and so yeah so I've been doing this for a long time, and then I'm, I've started mapping the world of Greyhawk for my own campaign, my own games, and then the internet came around, and I started and I started putting my maps online, and people started liking them, and then when I moved to California, I started realized now I need something to do, so I basically started doing it full time, and and I went from there. Oh man, that is so cool. So well, now take me back. I had no idea. I know all about your maps and that sort of thing, but I had no idea that you were uh, part owner of a game store for a while. Oh yeah, uh, we had, a, we had a, a little game store in a, a mid-sized, small, small to mid-sized Swedish town. And, and we sold role-playing games back in the day when the first wave, late eighties, mid eighties to, to mid nineties. And then we sold it off. And 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 we sold some computer stuff as well, but role playing games became more and more of the mainstay, so to speak. Role playing games and board games. So, yep. Wow, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. so we had role playing conventions games. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Then talk to me a little bit about the conventions. Did you organize conventions? Is that what you were yeah, doing? Yeah, part part of yeah, we were part of organizing a few conventions, local and regional in Sweden, and and yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. So those are uh, two of the hardest things I think to do in role-playing games is uh, <laughs> yeah. own a role-playing game store and try to organize a convention. Um, yep. and, and then you uh, started this Greyhawk project. Now, talk to me a little bit yep. about that. Had you ever drawn maps before? What was your, your sort of art experience before that? Uh, not so much art, but I've always been um, an avid hiker. And I've I've done a lot of flying, so I love to look at landscapes. And I've also been a photographer for a long time and done landscape photographies and stuff. So, so I've I've been been looking at landscapes and and hiking in landscapes. So landscapes is one of the things that I'm really interested in. I'm not a geologist by any means, but I'm I'm kind of a hobby geologist. I like to learn about stuff like that and read about it and stuff. So 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 when I've been gaming. It's like like everyone in gaming. I wanted to write games or rules or invent monsters and write stories, but I realized that others are much, much better than than I am about that. But maps, I realized that there was might be a niche for me if I hone in on that. And especially large maps, like world maps, campaign maps. Mm -hmm. Most of, of, of other artists, they they there's a lot of people who do dungeon maps and city maps and battle maps, but not that many who do to specialize in the large picture. 
and and so that became my my kind of my little niche where i felt that this is something i can do so and it's also part technical and part artistic so i kind of worked on my artistic side uh, alongside my my programming my my kind of technical side to figure out how maps work and so i tried to incorporate as much knowledge and, and skills from real world mapping and combine it and present it for gamers that that's the kind of the, the my what i tried to do yeah absolutely i think there's more rules to maps than uh people know uh, sometimes you know i will draw a map for a fantasy area or something and then give it to a cartographer who will be like well this isn't really the way rivers work or you know um <laughs> yeah it, it, it doesn't yep. really make sense that you would have this where it is, but what do you think about yep. it over here? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. What are yep. some of the uh, rules of cartography that uh, that you find people don't understand and you wish they knew better? Well, well, first of all, is that the world needs to make sense. And a fantasy world, you can have rivers that flow up upstream so to speak but they should be the exception they need an explanation it, 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 but the, the if, if fantasy world works like general meaning you have to have basic geology rivers actually kind of erode landscape they flow down river etc and and so, so a world in order to be believable have to be kind of generally following the, the normal rules and then you should have exceptions you can have mountains that are vertical and go for miles up and and they are made up of some strange magic material but then if you go off the real world then then you have to have a, an explanation for it fantasy or some other some, something like that and i always try to infuse some of that extra out of this world thing but that should be the exception and then you have things like it's always interesting to see fantasy maps when you see them a lot of people when they draw it most rivers tend to flow from from the north to the south because it's more natural when you draw it on a piece of paper that rivers actually flow down the paper for some reason and 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 so, so there's a lot of these things that people don't seem to to see the landscape in 3d meaning the real world that rivers flow downhill they don't flow down paper and and right. and also that fantasy worlds have a tendency of not being developed logically the whole world it's like you start in this little area and you invent a city and then you go on and and they, they have a life of their own and then now we've gone far enough so we just put up coastline and then means that you have rivers that start 20 miles from the coast and go across the whole continent and then they end somewhere and so i have a lot of these kind of geographical inconsistencies that i have to work with when i map a world that someone has just written right right yeah i mean that makes total sense that you know you you've got these like challenges of like oh okay so you've sort of already established these things in fiction yeah but mm -hmm. it's hard yep. to make sense of them in the real world and that sort of thing yeah. um yeah and and the other interesting thing when you work on projects is that when you write the stories and the adventures and stuff you you focus on the iconic locations it's like you have the giant desert here the high mountains there you have the 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 jungle here and the polar region there but as a map maker i have to my biggest emphasis is trying to bridge one to the other if you have a jungle here and a, a desert there then you need to have a lot of area in between because the jungle doesn't end and a, and a desert just starts so it's mm -hmm. these kind of in between regions that i have to kind of patch up the the, the the iconic locations so so i usually spend more time on the the things that aren't even written about but they logically need to be there in order to make the world believable yeah yeah totally totally and which is must be so cool because then it's this added area there are these more features than we thought the world becomes richer and you yeah. know a designer and say oh well now i want to take this and and do more with it right um yep. Yep. which is uh let's talk a little bit about your Greyhawk map project which is mm -hmm. you know one of the first things people saw and then it uh you know got you hired as a professional cartographer for a lot of fantasy places what is this Greyhawk uh project that uh, it was simply mentioned? i started gaming in in when when i started running my own games i wanted a game setting and and so i simply picked up the greyhawk box and kind of fell in love with it and and i loved the darlene original map but i wanted a map 
to kind of tell me all the details. I wanted to just know what the, the countryside looked like and, and all the how far was it between all the villages and, and the tiny little rivers and creeks and, and all that. So so when digital, uh, digital tools came around in, in the mid 90s, I started mm -hmm. picking them up and started to work on it. And, and I just kept working on it, adding more stuff. And then a few years later, then the internet came around. And all right. of a sudden, I could put the, the stuff online and people could start seeing it. And that was it. The, the cat was out of the bag, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. And it is, I mean, it is huge, right? This map of Greyhawk well, is yeah. detailed yeah. The, and huge and amazing. Me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the Flannies, uh, which is like a sub little sub part, like Europe, it's a big peninsula with small. And that one is 116 by 110 inches so about 10 feet wide and it's yeah. mapped in in there's like thousands and thousands of place names and roads and so i basically tried to read everything that was ever published for the setting and put all the details there so if a place was ever mentioned somehow i want to put it on the map wow so uh like are there places we would recognize like the tomb of horrors on the <laughs> map and that's sort of Oh yes, yeah, definitely. Every 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 place, and not only that, it's all the places that is mentioned, like the the in the adventures, like there's a little inn called so and so, and a little village on the way from big town out to to whatever little adventure location. So all of that, and it's taken me. I worked twenty years almost to the month on it. So yep. Wow, that's yeah. So awesome. twenty years. <laughs> yep. Oh my and gosh, working. Well, Oh no! Congratulations. That's all I was going to say. What were you going to say? Thank you. Yeah, I was. I just released the uh, the latest version of it a few just a few days ago to my mm -hmm. patrons, and in December there will be a new version. I've edited the terrain, made the colors look better, and added a whole bunch, hundreds of new stuff to it, and much more wow. details. So yeah, that's great. That's incredible. And for people who uh don't know then like how can they check out this map is it through your patreon uh, yes either through patreon if you want it right now but there is a version at ghmaps.net that they can download and the problem was that there was something with my wordpress so my site might be a little bit wiki for a couple of, of days until i fixed it but the, the map should be there and and you should be able to to download the versions because all of it that i do for greyhawk is is i put it out there for free it's just wow. that my patrons get a chance to tell me what I should work on next, and they get to see and get pre-versions and pre-releases while I'm working on it. That's awesome. So how do you uh, go from then making this map online to making maps for other people professionally? Well, that was simply then, then others have found out that I did it and, and they simply say, oh, can you make a map for me? So they started sending me emails and, and, and stuff. So, so then I realized this, this is kind of cool. And after a few small projects, then Wolfgang Bauer reached out to me and asked, can, can you help out doing Midgard? So, so he was going to, to work on Southlands. That was the big expansion to the south from the, the original Midgard campaign. And so I got work on that for, I think it was about five years now. And, and then I've been any nominated three, three times. And, and wow. I was part of the, the mid, the, the Midgard setting was uh, nominated for best setting. So I was kind of part of it because I wrote like my, my maps were like eight pages in the book. So I, I have a little, a little part of it, but I've been any, any nominated both for Southlands and for my Greyhawk map. Oh my gosh, it's uh, it very well deserved. Um, the Southlands map Thank is you. also a huge map, right? Oh yeah, uh, oh, we yeah. Should, it's, it's we huge. Should... Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, in terms of scale, you know, you said you like to work in bigger scales. Uh, like, how big is the Southlands? How many, you know, miles, quote unquote, or kilometers are we dealing it's with? It's about Africa, so it's probably about six seven thousand miles across and the flanese map is roughly nine thousand no it's it's seven thousand miles across and and Ooh. and it's way bigger so yeah so 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 i work with with the whole like continents or subcontinents at least i've done a mm -hmm. few few smaller maps and i did one for for the uh, uh scott gable i forgot what the um he had uh, for zombie uh, zombie sky press 
that uh -huh. just came out about the um it was uh, something with fairies a little a cool adventure oh, right. and stuff and i did some battle maps for there so i've done and i did a city map in that is in the southlands for pair busted as well so i've done a few kind of close-ups as well but but the the large picture has been been my kind of forte and my my speciality yeah yeah well and you've continued to do those very large beautiful maps for cobalt uh mm -hmm. and and done some really amazing things do you have anything that you're most proud of uh either that you've worked on with cobalt or is it you know is it your greyhawk map that you've created well the greyhawk map is kind of my my that was my coming out project and the one that i've been working on for 20 years so in in, in many ways that's dearest to my heart but when it comes to technical standards the the latest midgard map is is probably it's better than than the the greyhawk maps by far and i'm also just wrapping up a project for a small publisher called griffin lore games and that one will be my best map technically by far it's not enormous it's only but by five to eight hundred miles across depending mm -hmm. on how much will be cut off and and when it goes to a poster map but that one will be the the technically the best map that i've done because it's a lot more feature rich rich and much much better quality that way and and there is a i'm wrapping up a new midgard project too that will come oh, out cool. next year some sometime Wow, and that's that one incredible. will hopefully. So now I will try and and up the standard a little bit, but it, it also needs to fit in with Midgard and Southlands, just like in 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 my Greyhawk map. I had to I kind of set a standard to begin with, and I have to kind of live with it. That's why I'm next year I will start mapping the Flannies all over again, so so I oh can do it at about ten times better scale. So that yeah. So, so that's wow. my next big project. There, I will. Uh, for, when it comes to Greyhawk stuff, I will do two things. One that I will try and start mapping the rest of the world in the same standard that I did with the Flannies, and then I will start mapping the Flannies at about ten times more detailed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we have a people in the chat are asking. They want to know what your website is again, where they can see this map. Uh, so maybe we should check. Maps dot net. Dhmaps dot net. Uh, yep, that's great. Right. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. That's excellent. So when you are saying like, oh, you'll do the scale 10 times better. What does that mean? Does that mean closer? Does that mean further away? Uh, that does that mean? That, yeah, if, if you mean resolution, the Flannies map is about four pixels per mile. And, okay. and, okay. and, and I will, the, 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 the ultimate goal in my new mapping will be to, to, I will map it at a hundred feet per pixel, meaning you can see individual houses and, and you can almost see individual trees. That's the, the resolution I'm, I'm aiming for. But when you actually publish the map, it might be a little bit less. So, so, but roughly things that are a hundred feet can be visible on the map. That that's the, so you can see streets and buildings wow. and stuff like that. That, that's the oh resolution yep got it got it and and so and that requires you to go in and start all over again uh yes yeah <laughs> and and also this time it will not just be a top down this will be a 3d map of the world i will actually construct the landscape 3d in real 3d so you can you will be able to to look at it from any angle and stuff like that yep Holy moly. And you've done that before, right? You've done that for some oh, yes. of the Cobalt yeah, projects. The Midgard, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. The Midgard projects are 3D from the mm -hmm. ground up. I Thanks to, oh, I had some time issues. So we had to kind of uh, uh, smooth things over and cut some corners here and there. But basically mm -hmm. there are, and, and I've done some videos and some flyovers and some, some images from space of Midgard for Cobalt. I don't know how much have been shown yet, but there are some really truly cool images that we can put on on big posters and stuff on 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 Midgard. So, yep. Wow, that's incredible. Yep. That's mm -hmm. really cool. And, and so, how is that different from uh, you know just a two dimensional mapping? Normally, you you simply paint in either like on on old traditional, but or you like. I normally do with Photoshop, and then you put you use Illustrator to put 
roads and symbols and, and text and stuff on top. But this is that you use software to actually construct, model the terrain. So you, you use various tools that, that construct 3D terrain and you erode it and you make the mountains look so you, you have the detail and then you take that and, and render it from a top-down perspective or from, from any angle and, and you generate and then you generate the text to map on top and then I take the text to map in Photoshop and, and paint in some extra details and decide that oh there needs to be some trees here and a little road there and and there is a small keep along the road etc etc things like that. And, and then I take all that into another 3D tool or I can use, I will use geographical information system, just like real maps. So you be basic, basically could use things like Google Earth or something and look at the, the fantasy world that way. And the ultimate goal is that I can provide these, you can use a tool like QGIS that is an open source. So people can simply put in and say, oh, in my world, there is a keep there. And in my world, there's a road going here and there is like a, a dragon lair there or a town and they be able to place that on the terrain so they can take the terrain data and do whatever they want with it. Oh so, man! So, so things, yeah. So you you should be able to get the 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 world, and then it will be your oyster, and you can play with it. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. I love that you're able to do that, yeah. and that's so in the spirit of role playing games, right? That yes. you can take yep. something and change it and make it yours. Yeah, uh, yeah, because that's what I do with the map, and I want others to be able to do so. And that's on my map. There is the source data for all the maps, so you can basically take all that and and do your own version of. It. And I want wow. to make that easier so you don't have to have an Adobe Illustrator license and you don't have to learn all this stuff. So you can basically take the terrain and put whatever you want there. So, so that's the ultimate. And, and eventually put that in like a game engine so you can have a world builder program. That, that's, but that's probably 10 years away. But that's what I'm trying to learn to, to do now is to, to be able to, to use a game engine so you can put in roads and, and dragon layers and, and heaps or whatever you want and look at your world that way. Yeah, that is really, really cool. What sort of yeah. tools are you using to, to build your maps? You know, how, um, how are uh, they I'm made? I use a, a lot of, first there is a set of tools that I use for, to actually create the terrain. And there are things like World Machine, Geoglyph, Vue, TerraGen, and a program that is just coming out called Gaia. That is an Indian mm -hmm. guy that is, oh, it's, it's fantastic. These are the tools to actually create the terrain. And then I use tools like Vue, Photoshop, Illustrator, and stuff to, to touch up the the, the texture maps add things like like roads and 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 heraldry and and symbols and text and all that stuff on top of it but i will also be start using gis tools like qgis and, and others that way so so but trying to make them look fantasy map fantasy like but still be be useful and full of information and also wow. to be able to produce a parchment version because there's like you have the the what I would call the in-game map, the game prop, meaning the characters go to the big city to buy a map to to get across to, to the other side of the ocean or, or across the other side of the world. They go to a cartographer in the big city and they buy a map and that will be something in, in handout, so to speak. And that, that will be like the parchment map with cool bumpy mountains and some things and, and there be dragons here and, and stuff like that. And then you have the other type of the map that you as a game master will use in order to figure out where the orcs should ambush someone and how far is the forest and where do you get lost and 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 how many rivers do you need to to are they flooded and and stuff like that. So so all the the uh, the, the kind of that you simply build you build the overland adventure just like you would use a dungeon map to to have a dungeon crawl. And so I want yeah. overland campaigns to be as detailed as dungeon crawls would be. Yeah, it's so true. And and they functionally can work like dungeon crawls mm -hmm. too. Yep. Um yep. you you run your own games, right? As well. Oh, yeah. uh, you're not mm -hmm. just yep. uh talk no, to I, me a I little do. bit about the games you run and where they, you know, the settings they take place in and the, the well, maps I, you I, draw for those. <laughs> Yeah, I it basically I, I I run all my games in Greyhawk. I when I play, I usually want to play in other settings because I want mm -hmm. to and 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 play. So I play in Galarian. I pl play with various other people. Play in in various D and D campaigns and stuff. But but the when I run my games, I I run them in set in Greyhawk, and I use my 
big map as my sandbox. So, so, mm -hmm. so I, my campaigns are very sandbox. You can go anywhere and, and you simply go around living. So they're not like we have an adventures and you have to go through these kind of things and then you come to the end of the adventure. No, it's more like, okay, what happens in the world tomorrow on, on this day? And then the characters go around and do things and, and the world kind of happens around them and they, they kind of affect the world. And, and that's, how my campaigns go on and, and they move around and often we don't travel that far at all we can i had a campaign going on for almost five years and we were in 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 around this city called rel devon and the next 200 miles and that was 200 like five three, oh, four or five years and and we played in in that maybe 500 square miles and because that was such a target rich environment, we have everything from evil tree ants to death knights to dragons and vampires and undeads and a whole bunch of stuff going on in that, that region, so to speak. Wow, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. I want to I want to come play in your game. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a ton of fun. Um yeah. so that we have a uh question um mm -hmm. from uh mystic melon boy who wants to know uh how would you recommend building a campaign from the point of view of a new player so and i know from chat that mystic melon boy has uh just started playing D D and that sort of thing so you know building a map building a world and, and a campaign yeah. uh if you're new how do you recommend going yeah. about that the, the, you, one of the big choices you, you should make is that first you should figure out what is my game style. You can kind of, first you should just get some adventure that is cool and run it through and see if you like, because a lot of great game masters, they run fantastic campaigns using the, the pre-built adventure paths or, or adventure modules. And that might be, and I love to play in games like that. So, so, so for some GMs, so, so some have that style that you take, you buy an adventure and then you, you flesh it out and you read it through and you do it. That's the easy way of doing it. And for most gamers, that is awesome. Most players love it and that might be the way to do it. And you should definitely try out and do that first. You get a sense of, of, of how to build an encounter and do that. But when, when you get, then comes the next big decision is that do you want to build your own world? For some GMs, that's fantastic. I want to create my own world, set my own stories, my own names, my own villains and heroes and stuff in it. That's fantastic. Or you can pick up one of the existing worlds. There is like mm -hmm. at least a dozen just in, in from the, the world of D&D &D that has been officially published at least go back a few decades to, to now. So you can use the obvious one like Forgotten Realms or something. And then you have more kind of esoteric ones like, like Mystera or, or you can have birthright or, or some of them are tuned more like undead or you can have like planescape if you want to to go around the different planes and 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 some of them more like a dark sun you more like a survival desert kind of post apocalyptic world and so on so if you have a certain feel then look into and see if one of these worlds would, would fit your bill. And then you take that world and you start reading through and, and read about one little area and then set up small stories or play the mm -hmm. stories that are made in that world or simply read an area and then take all the things you want and then make your version of that world, so to speak, and change what you want and keep the rest. And, and that's so, so, so I, because that way you get a lot of inspiration for free. Mm -hmm. And and that someone already done, and and then always steal good ideas from from TV series, from books, from from everywhere, and then sit down. And even if you create your own world from scratch, steal good ideas and then make them your own and make your own version of them. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I think that's so true. Uh, stealing yeah. is definitely part of the DM's toolbox, yes, uh, as definitely. far as I'm concerned. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and you can always yep. one of my favorite things to do is i take a thing i steal it and then i'll twist it just a little bit so it's unrecognizable yes. right and it's sometimes yeah. it's as yep. simple as taking a villain who's a man and making mm -hmm. them a woman instead or that yep. sort of thing yep. and it's like oh mm -hmm. now it's unrecognizable yep. and we go yep. from there so the yeah, yeah players will t take your ID and run with it and then all of a sudden it has his own life and 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 go with it and i think that's the other thing that is is kind of tough but necessary mm -hmm. when when you run your campaign is that trust your players 
and 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 don't try to to force them force feed them the exact and it's hard i fail often if there's something i fail it's that i want to hold on to my world and i don't want to let players affect it too much and and but that's important and and so have players that that you can work with because it's a cooperative thing they are there mm -hmm. helping you develop the world and you come up with these cool stories Definitely. We also we have another question from Samwise underscore Gamgee who wants to know, do you have any world building tropes that you particularly love or hate? Uh, <laughs> uh, I, one of the, the, the things that that I kind of uh, hate is these these worlds that are just uh, single dimensional in that way mm. that we have a world that is built around undeads or we have a world that is built around one theme only meaning we have a desert world and that's all there exists and to me then that could be cool that's what i use other planes for because then i can have small pocketed worlds that i can go to to just have one theme only so to speak but i think that if more of a fantasy world need to be more kind of the whole thing sh should be there and it should make sense and and to me that, that the world and it doesn't need to be make sense in the real world and and also that a lot of the fantasy worlds are too close to the real world in my opinion it's like if you have dragons and vampires and stuff that means that they are powerful enough they will shape the world so if mm -hmm. you don't want a world run by by the most powerful creatures and forces you have to figure out some natural way of limiting them and and for instance dragons are mainstay in 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 D, D and and fantasy so i was figuring out why is not dragons running the world why isn't there tons of dragons everywhere and 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 so i was thinking that and also why do tra dragons hoard treasure so in 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 my version of of greyhawk the reason they hoard treasure is that they in order to incubate their eggs, they normally would use dragon bones. That that so they go out. A dragon will have to go out and kill another dragon, get the carcass in, and use that and that kind of the remains in order to get there to incubate their own eggs. But then mm -hmm. some dragons realize that instead of dragon bones, you can actually use treasure like gold and silver and 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 valuables as as a substitute for it. And that meant that you can hoard. So dragons hoard that in order to be able to reproduce and 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 to incubate eggs so male dragons they they create they they hoard this in order to attract female dragons to come and lay their eggs in there and and some in some versions species of dragons then it's the females that create all the the, the thing and and the males have to come in and 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 bring treasure to them and and in order to bring it so so it was kind of a substitute and and in some dragons they don't skip that they they don't hoard treasure they simply go out and kill other dragons and drag the carcasses and and that's how they can do it so that way i put a natural limitation on dragons and i also made it, it, it that was a reason for them to to actually hoard treasure they're not just doing it it, it was like it was purpose so i always try mm -hmm. to to make if the world works this way there must be a reason for it so so that's kind of my philosophy in world building and and fantasy should affect it meaning if there are undeads in the world that that means that there is an, and gods for instance in, in i don't i'm an atheist in in real world but in fantasy then the gods do exist and they are powerful and i have to figure out how does that work so in my version of the world then the gods get power from either people worshiping them or believing in them or they are scared of them so the god of mm -hmm. so gods can simply go one way or the other so evil gods of death for instance they make people scared of them and that way they get power from them yeah it, one of the things that i always think about in my worlds is diamonds right being the if diamonds are the key ingredient to bringing people yep. back from the dead they must be mm -hmm. even more coveted than they are in yeah. the real world yep. right right exactly. everybody yep. wants them mm -hmm. uh and yep. so therefore when the players need them it's even harder to get your hands on them and that sort of thing yep. and and do mm -hmm. our nobles just stockpiling these things waiting for when yep. they get killed off and pulling them off mm -hmm. you know that sort yep. of thing so. yeah you can build whole campaigns around getting the the ingredients for the powerful spells and stuff like that and, and if the ingredient is needed for powerful magic that means that there will be like something that is needed for for to build car batteries today or something like that for they they they, they will build they go out in the world and, and try to to find it and and it will shape whole economies 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So absolutely. fantasy economy is an, an underrated science, in my opinion. That someone who who has knowledge of economy and play D and D needs to to write a thesis on on fantasy economy and and how it would work when when you have the the um, the, the the gold and and the the dragons and 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 all sorts of stuff and magic involved in it and stuff. It's like a, a dragon. Someone kills a dragon and you have the inflation because all of a sudden there is like so much treasure going around. So that kind of <laughs> ruins the economy for 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 maybe decades to come in one area yeah yeah I'm sorry my yeah, little doggy is making some noise i'm just gonna lift lift her up here oh, oh so, adorable yep yeah, so. <laughs> thank you yeah she was whining she wants up yeah 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 absolutely the one of the uh so there is a woman named uh emily dresner uh who actually has written a book about uh fantasy economics and economics oh, in dungeons and dragons awesome. games and stuff oh so, awesome i need yeah. to f I, thank you for that i need to to read that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so that's really cool so if you're you're interested in that there's more on that but uh, as far as the future of the tabletop industry goes, uh, what are your hopes, either for yourself personally or for the industry as a whole? Like, where where do you hope to see the industry and yourself going in the future? And when I start with industry, I think that that now we're in the the third and the biggest golden age of of tabletop role playing games, and and I've been I'm old enough that I've saw the first wave and then the second wave and and now the third wave that is the biggest and the first time that tabletop role-playing games part of mainstream culture all of a sudden it's like references that almost everybody at least younger people they know about it so so in that way it's, it's interesting but i'm seeing a couple of of trends that it, one mm -hmm. is that it now becoming such a big hobby and big industry that we are starting to see it's diverging into to different subgroups that before it was like well, I, you played one of, when I started, it was like five different games. You played Traveler or D&D &D or RuneQuest, maybe, or, or <laughs> something like that. And then there were some people who played Paranoia or something that was not really a role-playing game, but it was part of the same culture, so to speak. But now it's going mm -hmm. all over the place. And one of the, the things that I think we will see in the future is that it will the, the lines between uh, computer-based role-playing games and, and tabletop will blur. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure about it because the computers will be able to handle more and more of what we traditionally see as tabletop role-playing game features. Like uh, it, you can have advanced artificial intelligence that can play NPCs and, and you can have all, almost all the facets that you have in, in a tabletop role-playing game can be facilitated on computers more and more, which means that will probably be a whole range of things that some people that just want to go out and bash and kill things and 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 and, and bash barrels and and get gold and and kill monsters and get experience points fine and then you have people who all they want is the social bit they want the 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 campaign bit the world building bit whatever and there will be a way to put that in a computer and present it well and, and handle it and i think that will be part of it there will be some grognards and some people my age and stuff <laughs> that will never adapt to it but younger people i'm pretty sure that they want computers to take care of the boring bits like the record keeping and the number crunching and i think mm -hmm. one of the the key things is that we've seen the past like 40 years is that every publisher when they want money they go out and print a new edition of the books and and they publish books and that's their main business model and have been but that's changing and just look at dnd &D. when i see wizard of the coast today they don't earn their majority of their profits on actually selling books that's my guess is that mm -hmm. it's licensing they, the majority mm -hmm. of, of their profits coming from licensing it to computer games, to TV series, to all sorts of stuff. And they're selling the books as a way of building the brand and, and getting people into the brand and to love the game and so on and so forth. And also when you when you putting all this stuff into computer programs then all of a sudden to change the rules meaning to, to have a new edition, it goes from being a revenue source to actually be a cost. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, I don't think we will see rule system evolve simply because the publishers say, oh, now we want new books. The, the rules will be more like computer games. The features will evolve because the players demand it, so to speak, and we will have different ways of, of doing it. And I don't think books will go away. 
but the books will have a different role in 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 like five years or, or ten years from now then it will not be something you use when you begin at the game table you will have reference with all the rules and all the, the stuff they will be on a tablet or a computer or even augmented reality glasses and stuff like that soon and the books will be there for inspiration. You will have a coffee table book with your campaign setting or the the, the awesome characters and their backstories and an atlas and, and stuff like that. Things that you have for, for emotional reasons, for to get inspiration from, to show your, your old auntie that, that this is the cool thing I do and to, as collector's items. That's where I think the, 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 the present for the fluff that will be presented in mm -hmm. awesome printed leather bound fantastic books. But the, the rules and stuff, they will live in, in, in applications on various electronic devices and we will use them and differently. And you will, in some people will play role playing games and not think about the rules. They, they, the number crunching will be doing in the background and you don't think about it. It's all about the stories and, and playing theater together and, and the app will just tell you that you failed. And some people will be really into it and they will see all the, the, the number crunching and all the cool things and they want to roll their dice and you can do that. And when you have dice with Bluetooth built in, so, so you roll the die and, and the app will notice the, the die roll by itself. Or you roll virtual mm -hmm. dice and, and they will roll on the table and everybody will see them. So yeah. that, that's where I see the, the general future a bit. And, yeah. and for me, yeah. it's, yeah, for me personally, it's right now I've been doing maps. That's my, my mainstay. Mm -hmm. And in five years time, I will probably... I will still do maps, but I think that to teach others to do maps will be the big thing, not to do the mm. maps themselves. In five years, a lot of the, the people that now buy and, and, and play into it, they, they will now, they want to do the maps themselves. They want to have their version of it and so on. So I will create some of the raw data and I will teach others how to do the, what I do. That will be the next five to 10 years. And in 10 years of, of future or, or longer in the future, I think that then people will know that too. It will be so simple that I don't need to teach them that. And they will be young and smart enough that, that I don't need to teach them. So then <laughs> what I need to do is that I need to provide content for the tools they use. And I have to provide, mm -hmm. build the tools for them. So, so that's where I see the, the long-term future for me personally. So I need to evolve and learn. So I spend at least one day a week just doing new things and learning new things at least. Wow, that is yep. hugely smart and a great way to approach things. And it's obvious, you know, yep. from talking about what you're looking at doing, how you build your tools already now so that people can get in there and make changes. Yep. Uh, yep. You you really do see uh, a great future and, and you're planning for it. That is inspiring and awesome. Uh, and yeah, I think I, I, uh, the I say, merging... I love this, this, yeah. I love this business uh, in that way and, and, and the gaming community. And, and I see the the old way of, of having your paper character sheet and roll 20-sided dice will never die, but it will be a niche thing in a much mm -hmm. broader spectrum of how to play. And we saw like LARPs, for instance, when, when you can have VR tools and AR, you can LARP and you can combine LARPing with 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 tools or rules that we normally see in tabletop role-playing game or computer role-playing game. So I think there will be a whole range of, of, of things in between that we haven't seen yet. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, and you know, my last question for you is what advice do you have for people who are going to do what you want to do? People who want to be the next, yeah. uh, Andy Meyer, what advice do you have? <laughs> I, I have two advice. One is to find your niche, find something that you're passionate about and, and then pursue it. So have a vision and work hard on, on fulfilling it, so to speak. Find what you, something that you're good at because you can't be, no one can be, there, there are a few exceptions. There, there are some people like Wolfgang Bauer or, or Will Monty Cook or whatever, they, they can do lots of things. But no, hardly anyone else fits the, the giants in the industry. So find something that you're really good at and, and hone your skill and have a vision. I want to do this and then keep doing it. And thankfully, today you have all the means possible to reach out. You can do a website, you can be on social media and so on and Twitch and whatever and do it. The second thing is that learn to take critique. Because even if your idea you think is the best in the world, 
if you're going to ever let someone pay you to do it, you have to take criticism. And and it's like, I can maybe get something to 50% of the quality I want, but the rest is what my fans or my clients pushes me to do. And, mm-hmm. and, and so, so, so they have a vision and, and work really hard on, on getting there and hone that skill, but also learn to take criticism, ask for, for advice. What do you think about this? Is this good or not? And then always take criticism and then listen to it and then throw away the stuff you don't want and then go back and listen to it repeatedly and make sure that gets you better. I wouldn't be, my Greyhawk map wouldn't be 10% as good as it is if it weren't for all the, I have a Facebook group with like almost 1800 people. <laughs> and and when I post wow. stuff there, they they are the most knowledgeable Greyhawk people on the planet. They They simply devour everything. And 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 they tell me what's wrong, what needs to be improved, and and then then you get ten different, especially when it comes to like, should something be on the map, or, or what should icons look like, or should this should map look this way or that way? You get ten different answers, and then comes your judgment, meaning you have to pick from the criticism and and try to make the best out of it, and and that takes judgment and trial and error. And and if you if you can kind of master that, learn something, hone the skills, and then learn to live with critique and learn to y- y- make use of it, then you can you can thrive in this industry. And also, don't go in in this industry expecting to be rich. That's that's not the case. <laughs> you you do this. You- you get paid in order you can work in this industry, but you will earn more on flipping burgers or do whatever, and 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 so so you don't get wealthy. This is not right. the industry. You work here simply because you love to work here, and and you need money so you can pay the bills and you don't have to work with anything else. If you can reach mm-hmm. that level, then you're on the elite here, and then there's like a few people that get rich, but that will never happen to me, and it will probably not happen to to hardly. <laughs> everyone else working <laughs> definitely definitely yeah. so uh but that's why you find so many passionate people in the industry because yeah. they're working mm-hmm. for something a greater calling yeah. other than money yes. which is yeah. definitely mm-hmm. true yeah um so we're at the end of our time here Anna. i we need yeah. to have you back on so that because sure. i feel yeah. like we just scratched the surface but uh if people want to know more about you where should they go and what should they do the uh, ghmaps.net is a good start. And then I have patreon.com uh, forward slash Anna B. Meyer. That's my Patreon page where you can see a lot from, from or they can simply go to Facebook and put in uh, Greyhawk Maps by Anna Meyer, or they can Anna Meyer and Maps, they, they will probably find me on Facebook. And and I present a lot of stuff there. And I have my Facebook, Facebook group, the Flannies Geographical Society, apply to, to become a member. And there's three tricky questions or not so tricky tricky questions about getting in there and and that's where we discuss Greyhawk and mapping Mm -hmm. okay awesome that is excellent well people should definitely go check those out uh i'm at james intracasso on twitter and i'm at worldbuilderblog.com if you like this show it's also a podcast that you can subscribe to on itunes google play stitcher and all the usual places uh and you can check it out over at don't split the podcast network.com And if people want to hear more live, obviously every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, that is when we're doing the show live, except for next Friday because I will be at PAX Unplugged. But the Friday after that on the 7th of December, uh, you can join us right here on the Encounter Roleplay Twitch where my guest will be Stephanie Bryant, the creator of the Threadbare role-playing game. Anna, thank you joining me i really appreciate it and uh, everyone out there be very very kind to each other we'll see you later